So you may have heard of this term, it's called bad bank, and wondered what the heck does that mean? Well, in short, a bad bank is a bank that's put together to bail out other banks, to buy illiquid investments and loans that just didn't go so well. So stay to the end to find out the four main models of what a bad bank really is. So I, I started diving into this because it was interesting. Like what happens when a bank, a financial institution goes insolvent? Just what happened in 2008 to all those banks that went belly up, to all those loans that they were holding? Well, they mostly went to bad banks. And bad banks are basically set up to buy bad loans. Just like the name says, it's kind of silly. And other illiquid, let me preface, illiquid holdings of another financial institution. So the critics of bad banks say some things that I think make a lot of sense. I think what these bad banks do is it encourages other banks to take undue risks, lending to moral hazards, knowing that a poor decision could lead to a bad bank bailout. But if there's really no risk to the bank that's taking all these excessive risks, well then why wouldn't they? When the bad bank's just going to come in and bail them out. But bad banks are set up in times of crisis to help long-standing financial institutions recuperate their, their reputations and their wallets. I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm in the insurance world and we only work with large mutually owned insurance companies, but there's stock owned insurance companies. And if you all recall, there was one called AIG. And AIG went insolvent. They took on a lot of those risky deals. They did loans and all sorts of insurance up to 150, sometimes 200% on something. You can't do that. So what happened to them? Well, bad banks bailed them out. None of their clients suffered any losses. Matter of fact, AIG is still existing today. They operate under a bunch of different names, but they were a bad operator. Why weren't they punished? Why weren't they literally made let to fall apart? Well, that's a good question. Examples of bad banks include Grant Street National Bank from 1988 and the National Asset Management Agency created by Ireland during its own financial crisis in 2009. The Federal Reserve proposed using a government-run bad bank as part of its response to the subprime mortgage meltdown in 2008. Now, although it considered an alternative strategy involving guaranteed insurance instead, the bad bank concept has been used with great success in the past, and it's a valuable solution for banks seeking shelter from the financial crisis. And you could say that's good on some sides and bad on others. I say there's a little bit of both. The clients of these bad, risky institutions shouldn't suffer because they took on too much risk, but the company that took on too much risk should not just get bailed out without any financial consequences, give or take. Banks must make five sets of choices when setting up a bad bank. And those include asset scope, organizational model, business case, portfolio strategy, and operating model. These decisions must be made while considering the impact on funding capital relief, cost feasibility, profits, and timing. Governments are smoothing the way for the creation of more bad banks to ensure future stability. That's scary, right? They're paving the way, smoothing the way for the creation of more bad banks to ensure future stability of our financial system. As if they're saying to us, well, we know some of these banks and these financial institutions are doing some risky things. So we're just going to, we're just going to create some things to make sure that we can smooth the way for these bad banks to, you know, help these risky companies that shouldn't be allowed to operate the way they are. My gosh, it makes you really think about it, right? To ensure future stability of the financial system by providing an understanding and managing regulatory accounting and tax issues, as well as providing backing where needed. Of course, there's gotta be backing. They call that bailouts last time I checked. So let's return back to this. So the return to this idea aims at restoring confidence in investors, you, me, and all the other investors. They want confidence in us. And they want to do that through clear separation between good assets and toxic ones. How many of you want to buy toxic assets, huh? Anyone? Anyone? No? Bueller? Great. 
They do that by allowing efficient management with clear incentives for portfolio reduction and regaining trust via transparency into the core business, which lowers the monitoring costs and et cetera. So there's four main models that exist. The on-balance sheet guarantee, which is a structured solution. Then there's the internal restructuring unit, which we've all seen that happen, right? I mean, look at, uh, I, I, I hate to hit below the belt, but let's talk about that one. The structured solution. How many of you have ever heard of Merrill Lynch? Merrill Lynch, pre the financial meltdown of 2008, the Great Recession, was the premier financial advisory. They were the best brokerage, like everything, every time when a client brought me a Merrill Lynch statement, I'm like, I'm never gonna get this account. And then during the Great Recession in 2008, Merrill Lynch went bankrupt. But through what I would anticipate was this structured solution, Merrill Lynch was absorbed by Bank of America. Now, I don't know if Bank of America wanted to absorb them or if it was forced on them, but it was a structured solution for sure. Now, Merrill Lynch still operates, still out there managing many of your investment portfolios, but who owns them? The bank. One of the riskiest operating banks out there, Bank of America. And that was the structured solution. Let's keep moving on. Internal restructuring unit. So the internal restructuring unit would look at the balance sheet and restructure their current balance sheet to see, can we p pull out some of these assets? Can we sell off these divisions? What can we do? And we saw that in 2008 too. And we're gonna see it this time as well. Special purpose entity. So these are off balance sheet. So a special purpose entity is an entity that's set up to basically fix the problems of the broken entity, if you will or the hybrid structure combining both approaches. So we always love hybrids, right? Well, you don't need to just put gas in, you can put electric in this one too. It's kind of like here, we're gonna just combine these two different approaches to make this work. But I think at the end of the day, when we really look at this, okay, is it bad to have bad banks? So when we think about these bad banks and we really look at what exactly are they put together for? They're put together for what's about to happen. They're being put together, they're being structured because they know the, the powers that be, if you will, they know there's problems. They know because they, they do their research, they look at the accounts, they do their accounting, they look at all the numbers and there's gonna be banks that go bankrupt this time just like they did in 2008. But you know what? Because the future hasn't happened yet and none of the banks have gone bankrupt and none of the financial institutions have gone bankrupt or insolvent, it's easier just to go back to 2008 and really look at what happened there. That was a bloody mess. I was a financial advisor during that time. I remember watching them just go down one after the other. Investment bank after investment bank, financial institution after financial institution. But to the public, they had to restore confidence. And how they did it is right there, right there that we just talked about. Bad banks, these structuring, these, these off and on balance sheet restructuring programs. And we saw it happen but we didn't, it's still happening. It's, it's almost like a free hall pass to the banks and the financial institutions to go out there and just do risky business, trying to shoot for the moon. And then when it doesn't work out, well, that's okay. They'll just do one of those fancy dancy structuring things. We'll be fine. There's no one being held accountable. It's just like, well, if you screw up, we'll just fix it with this bad bank thing. And I, I, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. But what I do like is I do like that the clients of most of those companies didn't go down with the company because the companies just got restructured. And I think in the long run, that time it worked. It worked because the markets rebounded, things came back. Some of these bad, illiquid investments that the banks took on, the bad banks took on, became actually good assets. They were able to transition bad to good. And they probably ended up making lots of money from doing that. And you know, I, I know this to be true because I know that there was a ton of these old, these mortgages that were defunct, these bad mortgages that they did turn them around. They sold them off, they restructured them like this. And I know a lot of them worked off, worked out and made tons of money. I mean, think about it. How many of you, if you had the means and the money would have went back to 2009, 10, 11 and bought as much real estate or bought as much paper on that real estate as you could have to control that asset. You all would have because you know the outcome. But 
when we were in the midst of it, it didn't seem like that was going to be the outcome. We had no idea the markets were going to turn around. It could have been a complete collapse. Now we're in 2022, and here we go again. Here we go again. This could be worse. Or maybe it won't be as bad as 2008. Who knows, because I can't predict the future, but plan for the worst, hope for the best, is how I always say it. And if that's how you operate, well, then I think you're in a good place. So in this episode, I just wanted to point the fact out that these bad banks exist. They're being created. They're, they're being created to smooth the way for what's about to come, and that's the sign. It's kind of like that song, signs, signs everywhere, there's signs. There's signs everywhere that something bad is about to happen. And what are you doing about it? Folks, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you like this video, check this one out. Is it bad to have a lot of credit cards with zero balances? We'll see you on the next one.